Okay, thank you everyone. Sorry for that uh, short break there. Um, Please say that despite many visa delays, <laughs> hastily booking flights on Monday night while we were at the restaurant, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our next, next keynote speaker, Marlene Mangami. Uh, her website lists her as a Zimbabwean explorer, software engineer, speaker, and cucumber enthusiast. Uh, she's a vocal advocate for using science and technology for social good. Please welcome Marlene Mangami. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. And who doesn't love cucumbers? That's, that's really the question here. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to be speaking to you about the topic of transcendence. So transcendence is a really sort of interesting word. And I hope <laughs> as I continue my, my talk today, you'll sort of understand why I decided to use that word when I'm talking about the power of representation. So before I get started, uh, Mark introduced me a little bit, but I, I thought I would also give you a bit more of an introduction to me. So like Mark said, I'm from Harare, Zimbabwe, and I flew 17 hours <laughs> uh, to get here uh, on Monday and, and just to make it for today, this one day of the conference, the last day. Uh, but very excited to be here. And for anyone that hasn't heard about Zimbabwe before, Zimbabwe is a country in the southern part of Africa. It is one of the many countries that was colonized by the British. So that's okay. Thank you very much to the British. But uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I really enjoy living in Zimbabwe and I've lived there for most of my life. I'm based there now. Uh, it's a very turbulent country to live in. We had some very high inflation rates a few years ago. If you ever heard of the trillion dollar note that was in Zimbabwe at some point. Uh, we also had a very uh, sort of interesting controversial president for a number of years. He was the president of the country for 30 years. So a really good place to live. And if you're thinking about visiting Africa, I can actually recommend it, even though <laughs> those were scary sort of things about Zimbabwe. It's a really great place to visit if you're ever thinking about visiting Africa. Something else about me is that I'm the previous vice chair and a director of the Python Software Foundation. Um, and so the PSDF is the nonprofit organization behind the Python uh, programming language. And uh, the mission and the goal of the PSDF is to pro promote and protect the Python programming language and to uh, advance the facilitation of the growth of a diverse and international community of Python programmers. So I have been on the board of directors for the PSF for about five years and only recently stepped away from the board in order to give space for new leaders to come through. And I really believe in the work that the PSF is doing. Believe it or not, Python is being used in every single continent in the world, including Antarctica. So there was a, an Antarctica Python meetup, which I think is amazing. <laughs> and very cold, probably, but very cool. Uh, probably penguins, maybe, was the theme. I don't know. But uh, it's a very cool organization, and I would encourage you to check it out. It's at python.org. Uh, something, another thing about me is that I was the founding chair. I'm no longer the chair right now, but I was the founding chair of PyCon Africa which is the Pan-African gathering of the Python community on the continent of Africa. It was the first time we had a Python, a Pan-African Python conference in Africa. And for some reason, I signed up to organize it. And um, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Honestly, I would not recommend it. But the conference went very well. And we had so many different uh, Pythonistas coming together from across the continent of Africa. It was in Ghana. And uh, we haven't had it this past year because organizing a virtual conference in Africa is very difficult. Uh, but in 2023, we'll probably have the conference again in person. So if you're thinking about speaking again in Africa, feel free to follow Pike on Africa on Twitter. And a final thing about me is that I'm a developer advocate at Voltron Data. Um, so I talk a lot. I give a lot of talks right now on engineering. Before joining Voltron, I was a software engineer at NVIDIA. And I really enjoyed my time there. I was working on a data frame library called QDS. Um, and it's sort of a data frame library that's powered by GPUs. So very cool library. I really enjoyed working on it. But I wanted to, 
I think the reason why I decided to move on from that role was that I wanted to also experiment with communication. I really enjoy speaking, really enjoy writing, and uh, fortunately got the opportunity to be a developer advocate. So, so I keep my job. <laughs> Feel free to follow Voltron Data uh, if you would like to promote my developer advocacy there, and they're VoltronData.com or Voltron Data on Twitter. So getting into my talk now, um, so this idea of transcendence, I think a good place to start with it is with sports, just to help us understand what transcendence means. So I'm just gonna play a quick clip for us. Okay. <laughs> So that was a clip, a clip actually from the UK, and this is from a scene where people are watching soccer, and uh, you know football is actually very popular across the world. UK, like the, the soccer that happens in the United Kingdom is actually extremely popular in Zimbabwe, and this scene that we just saw on the screen uh, is not just a scene that I see here in the United, you know, it's from TV obviously, but um, it's also something that I see in Zimbabwe as well. Lots of Newcastle supporters, lots of Chelsea supporters in Liverpool, uh, you know, things like that. But I am personally not a very big fan of uh, soccer. So whenever I see scenes like this, the question that comes up in my mind is like, what exactly is going on here? Like, why are these people acting so emotionally in this video clip? And I, you know, I sort of started to ask myself this question. Uh, over the years. <laughs> and, you know, this is something that has actually been studied by a number of people. And a few years ago, the New York Times <clears throat> published an article titled Sports Psychology, It Isn't Just a Game. And so the researchers from this article found that many fans can become so tied to the teams that they're supporting that they actually experience hormonal surges at the same levels and psychological changes at the same levels that the athletes playing in the game do. So that's incredible to me. So this quote was actually from that article and inspired by a professor called Robert Cialdini. And the quote is, our sports heroes are our warriors. This is not some light diversion to be enjoyed for its inherent grace and harmony. The self is centrally involved in the outcome of the event. Whoever you root for represents you. Another quote from this article was from uh, a researcher called James Dabbs, and he says the results suggest that fans empathize with the competitors to such a degree that they mentally project themselves into the game and experience the same hormonal surges the athletes do. So I think that's such an incredible sort of human phenomenon where we can actually transcend our bodies and make it actually seem like we are playing in the game, even if we're sitting and watching on the sidelines. And it's just incredible to me that that happens. And when I was reflecting on this a bit more myself and ways that I've, I've personally experienced it, I thought a bit about this woman. So I don't know if you know who this is. <laughs> Hopefully you do. But that is Serena Williams, and uh, if you've been following the news, you know Serena is retiring, which is devastating news for me personally. Um, but Serena has had an incredible career, and uh, when I was growing up, my dad was actually very into tennis, and my family, I, I, I clearly remember so many times growing up where my family would sit in the living room and we'd sit around a television and just watch Serena play. And I remember this one time she was playing at Wimbledon and it was the finals and I was so nervous for her. And it's like, I've never been to Wimbledon before in my life. You know, I'm, I'm an average tennis player at best. Um, but I was so, so engrossed in the game. And I remember uh, thinking to myself, whenever she won the game, there was like this surge of adrenaline that went through me. And I thought to myself, yes, you know, this is actually me. Like looking at Serena, I was like, you know, we're basically the same person. She looks exactly like me. And, you know, after that, after watching that game, I thought I could take on the world. And honestly, even recently, as Serena has been playing and the game she's won, 
afterwards I'm like challenging everyone to a tennis game and being like, let's go, <laughs> you know, because I'm pretty sure I'm like, if they gave me a try, if they gave me a shot, I feel like I could do okay at Wimbledon. But <laughs> no one's giving me a shot. But <laughs> I, I really love Serena, and I think this idea of transcendence came through even at a young age when I was 13, 14 years old. I was very uh, involved in tennis and ended up actually being the captain of the tennis team at my school. And one of the reasons why I would attribute that is from watching these games at home and watching Serena Williams play. So there are several things that I think this idea of transcendence uh, can teach us about the power of representation. And I think there are three main things that uh, transcendence teaches us about representation and why it matters not only in sports, because this is not a sporting conference, this is a tech conference. And uh, so I think I'm going to just share some of those things with you today. I think the first thing that I think about when uh, talking about uh, representation and why it, it matters is this idea of inclusion. So there's a quote that I really love. It's by a lady called Marianne Wright Aldman. And she says, you cannot become what you cannot see. And I think it's very possible for people. It is possible, maybe not very possible. It's possible for someone to maybe just suddenly out of the blue decide they want to become a tennis player. But it's very hard to do that if they've never seen someone playing tennis. And even if they have seen someone playing tennis, it's very hard for them to imagine themselves doing it too if that person doesn't look like them at all. And I think, you know, one example of this is I did not know that, that uh, ice hockey was very popular. Do you, like ice hockey is a game where people play a hockey on ice. And I didn't realize that that was very popular until I met Canadians. And, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't even know what that means because I don't, I don't, I have never watched ice hockey before I met a Canadian person. And then I met this person who was so enthusiastic about ice hockey, but I was like, I have no idea what you're saying because it doesn't snow in Zimbabwe. There's no ice hockey rink, there's no ice rink in general. You know, I've never seen someone playing ice hockey in my entire life. And so just in general, I cannot relate to the concept of being excited about ice hockey. And so when we think about representation and when we think about inclusion, one of the major things that uh, I think is important and why we need um, sort of people who represent different demographics, whether that's women or different races or uh, different spheres, which I will talk about just now, um, I think it's so important to have those people in visible positions, in, in positions of leadership, so that we can have a representation at all levels. So when we bring this back <laughs> to the world of technology, hopefully you can see those statistics on the screen, but I tried to look for data on uh, uh, diversity in, in technology. And for me, whenever I'm thinking about diversity, two of the major things that I think about is gender and I think about race. So if you're thinking about tech, one of the places, one of the things, the, the, the companies that you think of when you're thinking of uh, working at a global scale or at the highest possible level, you think about Google. Some, of, some people think about Google, maybe not everyone does. But uh, when we look at the statistics on people or Google's total workforce, which they have been sharing for a while now, I think even before 2014, but here we see on the statistics that in 2014, Google, 30% of Google's workforce were women and 2% uh, of their workforce were, were black. Um, over the years, that has changed incrementally, and that's grown to 32% of their workforce being women and 4% uh, of their workforce being black. So actually, that's quite a significant jump for black people because that is uh, doubling their numbers there. However, when we take a little bit of a, a closer perspective there and go back to that 2014, uh, those 2014 numbers, we saw that it was 30% uh, women and we saw 2% for black people. But if we actually take that down and look at tech specifically, we see that in 2014, there was actually 17% of Google's tech workforce were women 
and 1% of that tick workforce is black. So the, the likelihood of you meeting a black woman that works on tick at Google is very, very low. It's extremely low. And so for me, when I see these statistics, when I see these numbers, and even when I was first starting out in the world of tick, I was very discouraged because I knew that there was a lack of representation in the industry of people that look like me. And uh, th this can be very discouraging, even when we think back to the article that I talked about before in the New York Times, the researchers actually said that if you are watching your team and your team, the team that represents you, is playing in a game and they're losing, actually that starts to, for very impassioned fans, that starts to affect their self-esteem even out, outside of the game. And I know for myself, when I first got started in tech, I started, I was really, really insecure actually about my code. And I thought to myself, you know, if, <laughs> you know, I'm in this industry, I'm trying to get into this industry, I actually had switched before I was in molecular biology and decided I was going to be pre-medicine, but you know, being a doctor, you actually have to see blood often. <laughs> I did not realize that until I was in pre-med and then it was like, this is not for me, sorry. Um, and then decided to switch into tick. And when I started, I was very, very uh, nervous about it because I thought to myself, if other people uh, that look like me can't make it in this, in this field, what makes me so special that I would be able to make it? And so very, very insecure uh, as I started my work in, uh, in tech. However, uh, you know, I don't think that this subject or this topic of representation is just about gender and race. I think it goes beyond that. And oftentimes when we think about diversity, we think about it, or when we think about <laughs> just including people in, in our communities, we just think about demographics and we only think about, oh, how can I get more black people to attend the conference? Or how can I get more women to be part of my, my meetup? But actually, I love this quote, I think it's by a guy called Dero Basanjo, and it's diversity is about demographics, inclusion is about a sense of belonging. And we need to feel like we can belong wherever we go. And I think one of the things that makes us extremely special, I think as human beings, I'm not sure if animals can relate to this, but probably, but I don't know. <laughs> um, but as human beings, one of the things that makes us special is that we have shared experiences that we can relate to, regardless of our race, regardless of your nationality, regardless of your gender. And I think in, specifically in tech, there are several ways that we can relate to each other and several ways that even if you don't look like me or you don't look like people, uh, maybe from underrepresented groups or anything like that, that you can actually represent them or in some way reflect a part of uh, yourself in them. And, and I can see myself in you and you can see yourself in me. And uh, so there are two main things that I think over the years I've seen have been part of the shared experience. The first thing is learning something new. <laughs> so everyone I think has gone through the process of learning something new. And I remember when I actually first joined NVIDIA, I was so nervous about setting up my laptop and, and setting up my work environment and I hadn't used a GPU much before. And I remember one of the main things that helped me as a software engineer when I was starting out my career was that one of my coworkers, who was a man, like I think saw that I was really nervous and decided to set up some time with me. And he was just like, hey, I can see that you're nervous. Don't worry. Like I was really nervous too. And I had no idea what I was doing when I just started. And I remember thinking to myself, this is someone who really knew what they were doing. He was a senior software engineer. And I, I remember just seeing myself in him and thinking, okay, wow, if he can do this, and if he started out not really knowing what he was doing, and now he is a senior software engineer, I can do that too. Like, there's a journey, there's a pathway for me to get there. And I think sharing your story uh, when you're learning something new is really important. I think another thing is about imposter syndrome. Oftentimes, we can feel like imposters wherever we are, you know, and I think especially if you're transitioning or mixing two different fields, like I think research is a really interesting field because you're constantly exploring, right? And you're constantly having to try things 
from scratch. And uh, you know, researchers, you have to be knowledgeable about some random field. And then you're also contributing to open source, even if you don't have a computer science background. And I think that's really, uh, really unique. And, and really such a, a gift actually, because you can relate to so many people. So I would say when we talk about shared experiences, really being intentional about sharing your stories is great. Um, so several things, the two things that I think you can do with your shared experiences. The first thing is sharing your story with other people, whether that's tweeting, whether that's in your team. If you have another software engineer that you see as struggling or, or struggling with something new, just sharing and letting them know, hey, I struggled with this too. Another thing is good documentation. As you're writing your code, remembering what it maybe felt like to first touch that code. Um, sometimes it can be challenging if you're starting a code base and, and the documentation isn't great. And when we're intentional about that, we are thinking about representation and we're actually um, making things easier for the people that come behind us. Uh, so inspiration, I have a few more minutes, just wow. <laughs> inspiration uh, as well is something that I think comes from representation. And I think when we see leaders that are from a variety of backgrounds and a variety of faces, we actually gain a lot of inspiration. I think that's part of what I felt seeing Serena play. And if any of you uh, would like to you know, follow some inspiring leaders from the African women tech scene, here are three amazing women that are doing incredible things in the African tech ecosystem. One is Rebe Rebecca Antong, I think is her, uh, that you, how you spell it maybe. But she is a uh, entrepreneur. She is one of, she was Forbes, uh, in Forbes 50 most powerful African women. And she started a tech company a while ago and is a millionaire at this point, I think. But she is a fantastic leader and I think is a great person to follow as well on, on Twitter if you're on there. Joanna Nanjekia is also uh, someone to follow. She is a Python core developer. She was the first African person to be a Python core developer. She's from Uganda and does incredible work. She works for IBM as well as a researcher. And she is right now a board member for the PSF as well. So she does incredible work. You can also follow her. She's Captain Joanna on Twitter. And then Anna Makuruze is a is a, is a Zimbabwean as well. She's one of the people that has inspired me uh, uh, over the years as well. And um, she's the president of the Django Software Foundation and is the, f the founder of Python Zimbabwe, which is where I got my start knowing about Python as well. So these are all amazing women to follow if you want some inspiration. And then a final thing I'm going to talk about is using your own influence. And this is Guido Van Rossum who I met at a PyCon a few years ago. And Guido, when I met him, was wearing a shirt that says PyCon, Python is for girls. And I loved that. <laughs> I was like, that's incredible. And I think not only do you, you know, you don't only have influence just by being a black woman leading in tech, but if you are a software engineer and you're advocating for women in your space, you're advocating for minorities, you're advocating for whoever, new people, you know, new people who join your team um, and are intentional about that, what you do is you create safe spaces. And so I think even as a community, uh, as RFC as well, as we, you continue to grow your community, I hope that you would start to use your influence like people, like Rito, and uh, yeah. And I'm going to end there because my time is over. So thanks, everyone. The Slido is up on the screen. If anyone's got any um, questions for Marlene, then uh, now's a perfect time to ask away. Um, or equally, we can run a mic up to you if you want to stick your hand up. Thank you for that talk. That was fantastic. Um, so we have we have an RSC association in South Africa, all right? Um, but we should have it in many more countries as well. Do you think there's um, an appetite for for supporting research software engineers in in, in Zimbabwe and maybe other countries? Uh, and how how can we do that? How can we help get these things started? That's great. Thank you for letting me know. I didn't know there was a, a chapter in South Africa. Actually, I think Claire actually said there was a chapter in Namibia as well, which is very cool. Um, and I do think that you, to get, 
to get things started in other countries, you just have to be intentional about connecting with people from other countries. And how I got involved with the Python Software Foundation was I connected with Lorena, who is part of Sh Pilate Chicago. And um, she really invited me into the community, was very intentional about doing that, came to PyCon Africa as well. And I think sometimes putting yourself in uncomfortable positions because like, I mean, I shared all those things about Zimbabwe and like people are probably like, I don't wanna go to Zimbabwe at this point. But um, I think putting yourself in, in situations that may not be super comfortable all the time and like going to those spaces or reaching out to people on Zoom, um, reaching out to people on Twitter. But I definitely think there's an appetite for it, 100%. I think there's, there's a huge community there that uh, would be in the deep learning in Daba has a lot of researchers and uh, research engineers there too. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so Slido has woken up a bit now. Um, so the mm -hmm. first question which we got up there is, how do you stay positive when you're facing barriers? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a hard thing to do, but I feel like um, for me, I sometimes just have to not think about it, honestly, because I think we live in a world, one of the last things if I had had time about it, uh, was I was going to talk about how I also had tried to start, I started this nonprofit organization for teaching girls code in Zimbabwe. And I just was surprised by how, how systemic problems are and how systemic barriers are. It's not just about giving someone a laptop. It's not just about teaching someone Python. It's not just about one thing. It's a whole range of issues, right? And I think that you can really get discouraged if you look too much on the big picture, honestly. Sometimes I think you just need to keep going and, uh, and then every now and then when you have energy, zoom out and look at the big picture and then try to work towards that. I think always recalibrating yourself to um, remember the big picture things, but sometimes also forgetting about them or else, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you survive in, in this world with that, so. Um, so the next question we've got up there is, what is the biggest challenge for research software engineers and software engineers in general in Zimbabwe? Um, I think it's probably, I think it's probably the economy, honestly, because the economy in Zimbabwe is still very, very bad and it's still very challenging. And I think software engineers still to this day are not paid a great wage. Um, I think people are really still struggling and also just so even just getting people into research software engineering is very difficult because I mean, becoming an academic in and of itself is very difficult because you have to have had the money to go through school or the scholarship to go through school, I guess, sometimes. And so that is, is quite difficult. And I think a lot of the issues are economic. Um, but I will say that that's getting a bit better because of remote work. So I work remotely and I have worked remotely for my entire career. And because of that, you can earn a great salary living in Zimbabwe. So I think remote work is kind of like <laughs> solving this issue slowly. <laughs> uh, so next up, uh, how can senior staff onboard juniors by admitting that everyone starts clueless without sounding patronizing? Oh. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I think you just have to be, I think you just have to be authentic. And I think telling stories is really important. I think re remembering not to just say, okay, everyone is just clueless. So all of us are cute, clueless. Just telling a story about yourself and being like, this is what I did and I struggled with this and I deleted the whole database here and I did this or whatever. But telling specific stories about what happened to you and, and making it relatable in the sense of telling stories, I think, makes you more authentic, I would say. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I definitely wear my mistakes as a uh, uh, badge of pride sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so next question is, do you worry that you're expected to perform diversity work and getting pulled from other commitments? Yeah. Oof. Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I, oof. When I started, uh, oh, I don't know if I should share this story. Um, but I will just say that I think that 
I think that it's true. I think I think that that's just something that sort of comes with where we are right now, where, and this is one thing that I will just, I will just say that yes, I do worry about that. And I have actually had to set boundaries for myself um, so that I'm not constantly pulled away from work to be doing diversity stuff when I wanna maybe wor be working on engineering work, you know? And I do feel like as if you're leading a team or something like that, just be very cognizant of that, especially for people leading leading teams, um, so that you do create spaces where people are not feeling like they have to do diversity work instead of their job, because that means they actually fall behind. And then they're not being promoted to senior software engineer because they've been doing diversity work and they're now senior diversity chair <laughs> or something like that. And that happens a lot, I think, so, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot more questions up there, but uh, we'll have this was the last one, then we will go for some coffee and cake, and I'm sure you'll be happy to talk more afterwards. Um, so do you have advice for uh, how to find out what the best way to reach out to an underrepresented community is when you have no representatives from it? Mm, yeah, I definitely think that, mm, I don't know, about reaching out Twitter is great right now, honestly. I think everyone's on Twitter. And if you're looking to reach out to specific, well, not everyone's on Twitter, but a good group of people are on Twitter. And I do think using your social media um, to reach out to people, and maybe if you wanted to reach out to specific demographics, um, there are some hashtags that, that do, do that. So I know Black Tech Twitter has a hashtag. There are a number of other communities that have hashtags on Twitter. Twitter can be very dangerous. So even if you word that differently, you can get canceled. I, just, mm, I don't know about Twitter all the time, but it's probably the most effective way, honestly, to, to reach out to people. So I would say social media is, is probably going to be the best bet there. Excellent, thank you very much. Can we uh, have another round of applause?